I don't think I've broken any records, uh, but I did finish, and I promised myself I won't do it again. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you to hold me accountable to that. I might do the ascent, but not the marathon. I'm done with the marathon. Uh, also, we had a little drama this past week at our church. I want to let you know about uh, someone got access to our membership directory, which allowed them to get names and emails, and they sent out an email to people in the church in my name asking for money. And um, in response to that, we sent out a couple of emails trying to warn you. Um, and also, we have created a two-step verification in order to access that membership directory, which is called Elvanto. So as a result of that, that means it's going to be more difficult for you to access the membership directory, but it's also going to make it more secure. And uh, we um, want to let you know, we will never ask for money through email. So if you ever get an email claiming to be us asking for money, just start from a position of skepticism. This is probably not really the church. And I would say do that anytime. Anybody asking you for e uh, money through an email, I would start from a position of this is probably not legitimate, and then you can verify it and go from there. But we are sorry for the confusion. We will do everything we can to keep your name, email uh, safe and secure. Uh, but today we're in the book of Acts, and so I'm going to ask you if you'd turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts was written by Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, and these two books together make up 25% of the New Testament, which means that Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other author. Kind of a fun fact. And I want to begin by focusing on this phrase, my witnesses. Jesus is telling them they will be his witnesses. And this has very much an imperatival aspect to it. He's saying, I'm calling you to be my witnesses. You need to be my witnesses. And it kind of raises the question, what exactly is a witness? And the Greek word behind that word witness is the word martis, which over time came to be the word that we know as martyr. And so this word came throughout history to be associated with a person who witnessed to Jesus unto death. They died as a result of their witness or their testimony to Jesus. In the original context, uh, I, I think witness is a good translation of this word martis, uh, a witness. The way we use the word witness today is usually kind of a legal, someone who has seen or experienced a, a wreck or a crime, and then you ask them to be a witness. Please tell us, what did you see? What did you hear? Give us your report. Give us your perspective on what happened here. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. He's saying, I'm, I am about to leave you. I am no longer going to be here to testify to myself. Uh, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm leaving you with a mission, with a purpose. I'm calling you to witness to me, to be my witnesses in my absence. And let's ask this question. What specifically are they supposed to be witnessing to about him? Uh, for example, are they supposed to go around and tell people what he liked to eat? You know, what, what, is it, what is it that they're specifically supposed to be witnessing to? And I think we, we get some help and we get that question answered when, when, when we're told that they had to replace one of the 12, they had to replace Judas, and they have specific qualifications. Who is the person we should be looking for? What are their qualifications of the person who's going to replace Judas? And look with me at chapter 1 of Acts, verses 21 to 22. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So one qualification, we want someone, we want a man who has been with us from the beginning, the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. But secondly, I want you to notice, it's got to be someone who was a witness of his resurrection. Someone who saw him after Jesus rose from the grave. Saw him, talked with him, interacted with him, perhaps ate with him. Now let's ask this question, why would that be essential? Why not just someone who believes that Jesus died and rose again? Why does it need to be someone who has seen Jesus, experienced him, witnessed him, interacted with him personally, after his resurrection? And the answer is because that's at the heart of the message of the apostles. This is the heart of their preaching. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He rose again. 
We have seen him. We, we have witnessed him. We can stand before you and testify that this is true based on our experience and the experience of, of many others. Go talk with them. Go ask them. And the book of Acts is filled with these messages, these sermons. One third of Acts is, is sermons or speeches. Uh, I, think I read one place where it said there's something like 24 different speeches. And when you look at them, virtually all of them at some point get to this point. Jesus has resurrected from the grave. He's alive. That's the essence of their message. And just to show you, to kind of drive this home, let's look at Peter's first speech. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Peter says, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So notice how he appeals, first of all, in verse 32, to the fact that we are all witnesses. We've seen him. He is resurrected. This is key. And in fact, this is for Peter, he says, what you're experiencing right now, Holy Spirit poured out, people speaking in various languages and pe people who don't even know the, their, the language can hear and understand. Peter says, this is all proof that Jesus is the resurrected king. Like Peter's not even emphasizing what's happening, the experience. He's saying, this is proof of the essence of our message. What's the essence of our message? Jesus has been raised from the grave. And he sent his spirit. And the fact that you're experiencing what you're experiencing right now at Pentecost is proof of the essence of our message, which is what? Jesus is the resurrected king. That's the point. Uh, verse 36, this, he's made him Lord in Christ. And the message always comes with a call to respond. It's never like, just ponder that. Or just consider that. Or just let that simmer for a little while. It's like, therefore... Here's what you need to do. It's a, it's, a, it's a message that demands a response. There's always a call to respond. So in Acts 2, it's actually the crowd who initiates and says, what must we do? Jesus is the king, therefore what? And Peter says, verse 38, therefore repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Let me show you just one other example just to help drive home this point. This is the essence of the message of the apostles Look at chapter 3, verse 15. This is Peter addressing the crowd after they have healed someone, and now a crowd is gathered, and there's a lot of interest and intrigue. And what does he do? He stands up, and he addresses, he speaks. In chapter 3, verse 15, he says, You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. You killed him. Jesus died. But God raised him up. He's the resurrected king. We are witnesses of this. Like, we're just here to testify to what we've seen and heard. Here's the response. Chapter 3, verse 19. Therefore, repent and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And later on, as he addresses the church council, because this the religious leadership sort of brings them in and says, tell us what's going on here. And they say, chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In other words, therefore, you need to go to him and be saved. And the church council comes up with a plan. They're like, we're going to let you guys go, but you really need to tone this down and quit going around preaching like this and quit talking about Jesus, the resurrected king, and stirring things up. So we're going to let you go. You can be free, but you've got to keep your mouth shut. And in chapter 4, verse 20, they say, we can't. We cannot, but speak of what we have seen and heard. We've been told by Jesus that we are his witnesses, and we can't help but do that. We're going to go around opening our mouths and talking and speaking and telling people what we've heard. You can't tell us that we can't do that. And, and, and you and I are called to do the same thing today. We are called to be his witnesses. Now, you and I are in a slightly different position than the first apostles because you and I have not personally witnessed with our eyes Jesus having resurrected from the grave the way they did. But our message is exactly the same as their message and the basis, say, well, then how can we claim that Jesus is raised if we've not seen him? Our, 
Our authority, our basis is the eyewitness testimony of the apostles and the scriptures as they've been written. And uh, so, so our message is the same. Our message is the same as the apostles. Jesus Christ, buried, raised on the third day, resurrected. He's the king. One day he's going to return. Therefore, you need to respond with repentance and faith in him. Uh, salvation is found in no one else, no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Um, I, I had another exchange with the Mormons. They, they, they've, they come in our neighborhood and they tend to kind of gravitate to the park that's right next to our house. So I kind of interact with them and the same one sometimes more than once. And uh, one of them that I spoke with who I'd, I'd spoken with before, he asked me, he said, did you ever end up reading any of the copy of the Book of Mormon that I gave to you? And I said, actually, I read the first page. And I said, after reading the first page, I already found one contradiction, at least one, but I, one of note. And he said, well, what's that? And I said, on the first page, it says that there's a new revelation. And I said, the Bible is really clear. There's to be no new revelation. In fact, the end of Revelation actually warns if you add to the books, then you will experience the same punishment and plague that the book mentions. And I said, here you are saying there's a new revelation. That's a problem. That's a contradiction. And he said, no, it's not. And here's why. He said, first of all, the book of Revelation was the first of the New Testament books written. And he said, therefore, when it said there, there's no more to be added, it was referring only to the book of Revelation and not to any of the other books of the New Testament or else there couldn't be any other new books of the New Testament. And therefore, he said, it doesn't apply to the Book of Mormon either. Uh, here's one problem with his argument is th the book of Revelation is not the first of the New Testament books written. But even for the sake of the argument, if it was, even if it was the first one written, the other books of the New Testament are written by apostles, people who saw firsthand Jesus raised from the grave, or it's written by a person who had direct access and direct interaction with an apostle or someone who did, such as Luke. The, the claim that, that Mormons are making is that 1,800 years later, in the 19th century, all of a sudden, we have this new revelation from God. God has spoken in a new way, and we have this new revelation. And I would argue that is the very type of group that the New Testament's warning about. Like the claim of the New Testament is, he, he died and rose again, we've seen him. He appeared to us, and now we are simply writing down our experience. And, and, and if it's not a firsthand eyewitness account, it is, it is someone who has direct account access to it, like Luke had with Peter, uh, for example. And so um, here's the point that I, wanna, I really want to drive home here. This is a good reminder to us today as Christians. We have no new revelation. Right? Ever since the apostles... We have no new revelation. We are standing. Our ground, our authority is the first century writing of the apostles that we call the New Testament and, and, their, and their message. Their message is our message. Our message is not, is not new in any way other than we've been the recipients and we've experienced this salvation. But our message is the same as the apostles. What's the message? Jesus Christ died for our sins, rose from the grave on the third day, appeared to the apostles, Today he's alive and well, and one day he will return. That is the message. And when Jesus says, you will be my witnesses, this is the message that he's telling us we're supposed to witness and testify to. And so this is the message that is supposed to be frequently on our lips. We're supposed to be talking about this, thinking about this. This drives everything we do. When people spend any time around us, they ought to come away saying, boy, they always talk about Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection and the need to respond. I can't, I can't hardly hang around her without her in some way mentioning this. And it's a good question for us to ask. Is that happening? Like, is that true of you? Is it true of the, of the message of your life? If we were to interview the people who are spending time with you, would they come anywhere close to saying, yeah, that's, that's definitely his message. That's definitely what she's passionate about. Or would they say, Boy, he really loves his sports team, you know? He really talks about his sports team a lot. By the way, it's one of the advantages of having a sports team that doesn't win real frequently. <laughs> You're not too tempted to talk about it all the time. 
uh, would they say of you, boy, he sure does love his politics, right? Always talking about his politics. Are, are, are your talking points always the same as what you just heard on uh, cable uh, news? You know, some people, like, you know what they've been watching because they're just going down the talking points of what they heard the night before. And they're really passionate about it, right? And it's okay to be into that. I'm not saying you can't be into that. But I'm saying, is that the thing that you're known for? Like the people who are around you, the, the thing that Jesus says, this is what I want you to be known for. I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to open your mouth and talk about me. Death, burial, resurrection. I'm the resurrected king. We are called to be his witnesses. But next, we are called to be missional witnesses. Uh, this book is called Acts because traditionally this book was called the Acts of the Apostles. And over time, things tend to get shorter. We shorten things. So over time, it just became known as Acts. And that's a good, that's a good, it's a good title for the book because it's really what the book's about. It's about what the apostles did, their Acts. And what did they do? They did exactly what Jesus told them to do in Acts 1.8. They were his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. And, and if you read the book of Acts, it follows that pattern. It's no, it's no coincidence. So Acts chapter 1 through 7 is about the apostles being his witnesses in Jerusalem. That's what it's about. Acts chapters 8 through 12 are about the apostles being his witnesses in Judea and Samaria, which really just means greater Israel. And then finally, Acts chapters 13 through 28 are about the apostles being his witnesses to the ends of the earth. So that's one way to look at the book in these three sections. Jerusalem, then Judea, Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. Another way to sort of think about the book, to look at it from a big picture perspective, is that the book begins in a very significant city, Jerusalem, which is not surprising at all. This is the center of God's saving activity throughout the Old Testament, Jerusalem. So how does the book of Acts begin? Jerusalem makes total sense. How does it end? It ends in Rome. <laughs> Rome. <laughs> ends in Rome, which is sort of the center of the world in this day, culturally, politically. And then all throughout the book, you know, you've got these journeys, you've got these missions where they're going out. They're going, starting in Jerusalem and making their way out, and progressively they're going further and further out. And by the end, they're in Rome. <laughs> um, uh, uh, finally, another way to think about the book, to look at the book, the first half of the book is really focusing on Peter and his ministry, largely in Jerusalem. The second half of the book is really focusing on Paul and his ministry. He is, he is known as the, the apostle to the Gentiles, uh, the missionary to the Gentiles. And I kind of have a special place in my heart for Paul's second missionary journey his journey to Greece, which is recorded in Acts 16 to 18, probably is a special place in my heart because we were able to visit Greece a couple of years ago and follow in the footsteps of Paul. We got to go to Philippi and see where the first European convert, Lydia, was baptized. We got to go to Thessalonica, which they call over there Thessaloniki, uh, where Paul was run out of town. We got to go to Berea, where the, the people examined the scriptures. We got to go to Athens, where Paul... You know, talked with the philosophers. We got to go to Corinth, where Paul spent a couple of years and planted a church. Of course, it's a very strategic city located with two ports nearby. But you think about just the one journey that's recorded in just three chapters. Paul travels more than a thousand miles, spends something like three years on just this one trip, this one journey, with the focus of making Christ known to the ends of the earth. And I want to focus in on Paul's time in Athens and just highlight a few lessons that we learn about how to make Christ known, how to be missional witnesses, and what it looks like to make Christ known. First of all, we have to have a burden for lost people. Look with me at Acts 17, verse 16. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So Paul arrives in Athens. The first thing he probably notices is all of these 
temples and, and idols, and it would be hard to miss them. Uh, for example, the, the first temple that he probably saw was the Parthenon, which I have included a picture here, a picture that I took of the Parthenon, which is located up on top of the Acropolis in Athens. It's, it's kind of built in such a way that you see it for miles. He probably saw this miles away from Athens. To this day, they don't allow buildings to be built up, modern buildings to be built up to past a certain point because they want people to be able to see this pretty impressive structure. It's lit up at night. But Paul is, is walking to Athens, through Athens, and it says his spirit was provoked. The NIV says he was greatly distressed. Why? Because for him, this was a sign of lostness. People are lost. They don't know the one true and living God. And he had a burden for the people, and he had a burden for God's glory. Like God is not known in Athens, and Paul is provoked, and he's burdened for people. And, and I just want to point out here, people can tell if you care for them or not. They can tell if you're burdened for them or not, or if you just see them merely as a project. Like People can tell. If you see them as a project, well, I better share the gospel with this person, and then I can check the box and say I shared the gospel, and who cares whether they say yes or no. Like People can tell if that's really your heart, and people can tell if you're like, I really care for you. I really want to get to know you. I really want to hear your story. I really want to share with you this good news that I have. People can tell if your goal is really just to win an argument. They can tell if you're, you're, you're having this exchange of ideas, but your goal is just to win the debate. Or if your, your goal is really to try to get to the truth because you care about the truth and you, you care about them. So you, you, have to, you have to have a burden for lost people. If you don't have a burden for lost people, you're probably not going to make Christ known. And if you say, well, I, you know, that sounds good and I'd like to have a burden for lost people, but I just don't. What do I do? This brings us to the second key. You have to invest time with people. You have to invest time with lost people. Look at chapter 17, verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. So this is Paul's custom. He goes to the synagogue first. He goes to the Jews first. And then he goes to the Gentiles. He goes to the marketplace. It says every day. And the, the word for marketplace is agora. And I actually have a picture here of the, the ancient agora. You can see the Parthenon kind of in the back far right. You see the modern building there to the left was a building I think financed by John D. Rockefeller. But this green space, this is where the ancient agora was. This is where the people would spend time. This is where they went to buy food, to interact, to talk. This is where, just kind of the public place. And Paul went there, and it says he, he visited with people, he spent time with people who happened to be there. I like that phrase. The people who happened to be there. And I think one of the challenges for us is we think deep down, well, I just don't have time. I just got my plate is full. I don't have time for anything like this. And the response, the answer is, you don't have to add anything to your list. You don't have to go anywhere else. Go to the places where you're already going. Go to the agora. What's your agora? Wherever you're shopping, your school, your sports field, your neighborhood, your workplace, you go where you're already going. You're not being asked here to do anything, to go anywhere different than where you're already going. We're just saying here, just be intentional when you're there. Like when you're there, open your eyes to the people who are around you and have conversations and, and get to know them. And it starts by being intentional. It's just being intentional. God has placed you in a certain area, in a certain agora. Open your eyes to the lostness that's around you. That's step number two. Third, we have to build bridges to people. <clears throat> if Paul intentionally places himself here, he intentionally has conversations with people, and he starts talking about the Christian faith. And I love, the, I love what they say in response to him. Chapter 17, verse 20. You bring some strange things to our ears. This is really strange. And guess what? You and I are progressively living in a post-Christian society. And we cannot assume that people know or have heard the real Christian faith. They've heard a little bit about this and that, and they've got some awareness. But many people have not heard the Christian faith, the Christian gospel. And I can almost guarantee you, if you start opening your mouth and speak it, people are going to say to you the same thing they said to Paul. You're bringing some really strange things to my ears. I've not heard this before. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that they're willing to listen and they recognize. I don't know this. I haven't heard this. 
And they said to Paul, we're willing to hear more. We want to hear more. They were interested in anything new, chapter 17, verse 21. And I think we're living in a time today where people are pretty much interested in anything. Like, yeah, you got an idea? I'm interested in hearing it. Right? We've got to take advantage of that. Take advantage of the fact that many people are willing to talk about spiritual things. And so they say, we want you to come with us. And they, they bring him to what's called the Areopagus. This is this big rock area. Uh, it just, it's kind of located between the Parthenon and the Agora. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people refer to this as Mars Hill. I think the King James refers to this as Mars Hill because the Roman god is called Mars, but the Greek, Greek equivalent is Ares. And in the original, it's called Areopagus. And so they brought Paul to the Areopagus, which was the place where there would be sort of an exchange of ideas. And some people even believe at some point in history, this would be a place where they would have, you know, trials. They would try cases. And so they, they bring Paul here and they say, we want to hear you. Now give us your presentation. Who is your God? What are your views? And so look at chapter 17, verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So Paul starts out and he says, I can tell you all are very religious. And they probably would have said, thank you. Yeah. Yes, we are. What's he doing? He's finding common ground. He's building bridges. He's talking their language. In fact, he's going to go on and quote some of their poets. He doesn't quote or appeal to the Old Testament, though the Old Testament is driving much of what he's saying. It's definitely in the background of, of, his, of what he's preaching. But he doesn't quote from the Old Testament the way he does when he addresses the synagogue or Jewish people because he knows his audience. They would say, so what? So what does he do? He quotes their they're poets, they're philosophers. Look at chapter 17, verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we are indeed his offspring. Now, he doesn't reference their poets because he thinks of them as having all this authority. He's just finding a little nugget of truth, a little common ground in order to build a bridge, in order to get to where he's trying to go. And he also points out, he says, I noticed you have this one idol over here with an inscription that says to the unknown God. See, they wanted to really cover their bases. In case there's some God out there that we don't know about, let's have an idol to the God that we don't know. And Paul takes this as an incredible opportunity. And he says, so you admit there's a possibility there's a God you don't know. Well, yeah. He says, well, I'm here to tell you about him. And so the next, this is the fourth and the final lesson that we learn from Paul. He, he is faithfully speaks the message. You have to faithfully open your mouth and speak the message. And that's what he does. Look at chapter 17, verse 30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Notice again, Paul can't preach without talking about the resurrection, verse 31. Why? Because that's the central heart of the Christian faith, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So he gets right to the resurrection, verse 31. And he says, because Jesus is alive, that proves he's also going to return in judgment, verse 31. Jesus is the judge who's going to return to judge you. So I would just want to point out here, Paul doesn't compromise on the truth. Even when there are difficult subjects in the Christian faith, he doesn't compromise. He builds bridges, he finds nuggets of truth, he speaks their language, but at the end of the day, he does not compromise on the message of the Christian faith. He doesn't avoid it. He gets right to it. He doesn't even say, well, I'll save this. This is subject's a little difficult. I'll save it for another day, maybe when I've built a little respect for, with them. No, this is like day one, right from the beginning, we're getting right to the judgment, right? There's a, there's a lesson to be learned there, uncompromising clarity, boldness, right to the message. Jesus is the resurrected king. One day he's going to return in judgment. Therefore, notice the call to respond. You need to respond. You got to repent. Verse 30, God commands all people to repent since Jesus is the resurrected king. So there's the call. 
I want you to notice he is faithful to speak the message clearly. Uh, you know, we are certainly supposed to be kind as we speak the gospel and as we interact with people. My daughter reminds me of this when I interact with the Mormons. She says, Dad, you've got to be kind. Hey, you're getting kind of intense. Thank you. I, I need that reminder. I need that reminder. Kindness, right? That doesn't mean you compromise on the truth. It's speaking the truth in love, right? Uh, we, we certainly have to be people who, who do good things and do good works and meet practical needs and especially meet needs of people who are actually in need. We certainly are supposed to do this. The Bible is crystal clear. We are supposed to be people who are meeting needs and meeting needs of people who are in need. But, but all, all the good works mean nothing if we are not also opening our mouths and talking about Jesus Christ and his death, burial, resurrection, and a need for people to respond to him and repent and trust in him. That is the central calling of us as Christians, as, as Jesus' witnesses. You will be my witnesses. So we have to make sure as individuals this is central. It's on our lips. It's what we're passionate about. It's the gospel. And we have to make sure as a church that we are crystal clear on, on, on the message, this is what we're about. If, if we can only do one thing, this is what we must do. We have to open our mouths. This is, how, this is how the message advances. This is how the mission gets accomplished. It only gets accomplished when we open our mouths and we point people to Christ. Uh, we're called to be missional witnesses. This also means we have to be really careful in who we partner with. Other churches, other missions organizations, other missionaries. We have to ask the question, are they crystal clear on the gospel? Like crystal clear on what the gospel is? And number two, do they see this as being the central part of their ministry? Like do they see this is our main aim is to open our mouths and tell people about Jesus Christ? If not, I'm not interested in partnering with them as an individual, an organization, a, a ministry. This is, this is how the mission gets accomplished when we, his people, make this central, opening the mouth, talking about Jesus, pointing people to Jesus, and calling people to respond by putting their faith in Jesus. And this brings us to talk thirdly about being empowered witnesses. Jesus gives them the mission. If we're honest, the mission is pretty daunting. It's seemingly impossible. Like go to all the world with the message that Jesus is the resurrected king so that all people will respond and bow the knee and follow Jesus as king, that's seemingly impossible. It's daunting. It's overwhelming. But look at this incredible good news. Look at what precedes the mission. Listen again. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and then you will be my witnesses. I will be with you. I will empower you. Jesus says, I will not leave you. I will be with you by my spirit. He's been raised. He's alive. He comes to them by his spirit. He empowers them so that they can accomplish the mission. So yes, it's a seemingly impossible mission, but it's very possible because with God, all things are possible because Jesus is with them. He says, I will be with you. I will empower you. Therefore, you can accomplish this, this, this mission. And I, interestingly, in the book of Acts, there are three Pentecost type of experiences. I think many Christians miss this. It's very important, very key for reading the book of Acts. There are three Pentecost type of experiences, and they're just merely following Acts 1.8. The first Pentecost type of experience is, is in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit comes to Jerusalem. See, I will empower you by my Spirit, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That happens, Acts 2, we're all familiar with it. But there's a second type of experience, very similar, that happens in Acts chapter 8 when the Holy Spirit comes to Samaria. What is Samaria? Samaria is made up of the ten northern tribes of Israel who have intermarried with pagans. Right? But, but, but here's what's happening. The Spirit of God is coming on all of Israel. God's Spirit is coming on not just Judah, not just Jerusalem, all of Israel, even Samaria, even the northern tribes. And by the way, this fulfills some of the prophecy, some of the prophets like Hosea 1.11 who said that one day there's going to be a reuniting of the north and the south. 
the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, Judah and Israel are going to be united as one. How does that happen? When does that happen? It happens in Acts chapter 8 when the Holy Spirit is poured out on Samaria. Oh, the God is coming and reuniting the divided kingdoms, bringing them together as one, and His Holy Spirit is coming out so that His people can be empowered to accomplish the mission throughout Samaria. There's a third Pentecost type of experience that happens in Acts chapter 10. What's significant or unique about Acts 10 Pentecost event? Because this is the one that happens on the Gentiles. Not Jerusalem, not Samaria and, and Judea and the rest of Israel. Right? Now we're talking about the Gentiles, Cornelius. This is where Cornelius is converted. He's the first pagan convert. And the Spirit of God is poured out on the Gentiles. Why? So they can be empowered. Why? To accomplish the mission. So it's just simply Acts 1.8 being fulfilled. Acts 1.8 happening. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And then you'll be my witnesses. And that happens in Jerusalem. Literally happens. It'll happen in Judea, Samaria. It happens. Acts chapter 8. And to the ends of the earth. It happens. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius. Gentiles. To the ends of the earth. And it's God who's doing it. It's God's spirit that's coming and being poured out, empowering his people to do this. I, I, I remember reading somewhere along the way that uh, somebody said they thought the book should be called The Acts of the Holy Spirit because it's, it's the Holy Spirit who's doing this through the apostles. And that's, that's good. That's accurate. That's right. But I can imagine a person responding and saying, well, if God's the one who does this, if it's God and his spirit who are doing this, then we don't really have to do anything, Right? Or if we do anything, surely we're guaranteed it's going to always be successful. The church is going to always be successful. And surely we're guaranteed there's not going to be any conflict. And I think this is kind of how the disciples are thinking in Acts chapter 1 verse 6 when they ask the question, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, is this it? Is the kingdom of God about to come in its fullness? Are you about to sit on the throne in a way where it's seen and visible and obvious? And Jesus says, no. It's not yet time. And he actually says, it's not for you to know when that time is. That's above your pay grade. So therefore, don't worry about it. He's basically saying, that's not for you to be concerned with. When is the kingdom of God going to return and be restored fully? That is not what's supposed to dominate your thinking. Instead, this is what's supposed to dominate your thinking. I have a mission for you. And your mission is should you choose to accept it. Okay. Your mission is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And you are to fulfill this mission until I return. And, it, and then in the day when I return, you'll no longer be on mission. It'll be over. The kingdom of God will be restored fully. But until then, this is your mission. And it is a daunting mission. It is challenging it is seemingly impossible. And we're, we, are, we are reminded there will be times when it, we will be faced with great opposition if we are faithful, just like the apostles were in the book of Acts. Right? They, it wasn't always this incredible success story the way we usually define success. Right? Sometimes they're imprisoned, like at Philippi. Sometimes they're killed, like Stephen. Sometimes they're run out of town, like at Thessalonica. Sometimes they're well-received, like in Berea. Sometimes the people are reasonable. Uh, oftentimes it's kind of a mixture. It's a little bit of both. It's a mixture in Athens. It's a mixture in Corinth. And I think it's interesting. The book of Acts actually tells us there were three responses to Paul in Athens. It says some people mocked him. And I think that's a good reminder to us. If you open your mouth and talk about Jesus Christ, you will probably be mocked by some. And it's good to know that. It's good to be prepared for that. It'll probably happen. Don't let it shock you when it does happen. Talk about Christ. Embrace yourself. You'll probably be mocked by some. They mocked Paul. Right? They mocked Jesus. Right? Some people said, uh, you know, we're interested, but I, I'm kind of done talking for today. Maybe we'll save that for another time. And guess what? If you talk to people about Jesus, they'll say the same thing to you. They won't mock you, but you can tell they're kind of pushing it down the road. Just be ready. Be prepared. It's going to happen. It's going to feel awkward. 
But some people, it says, in Athens responded by trusting and believing, and they joined the church. And they're actually mentioned by name in chapter 17, verse 34. Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris, right? And perhaps God will use you to bring a person by name to Christ. And there'd be a person whose actual name you could speak, whose name will be in the Lamb's book of life, will be in heaven one day because God used you to open your mouth and point someone to Christ. We're not called to be successful. It doesn't say you have to be successful. We're also not told it'll be an easy road. There's nowhere where it says, oh yeah, you got this. Like the Holy Spirit's with you, therefore it'll be easy. No, it does, it's, we're just simply called to be faithful. We're called to be faithful witnesses to Christ. We're called to be faithful witnesses who are on mission, going. And the good news is we're empowered by Jesus Christ. See, our message is he's been raised from the grave. That means he's alive. He's the reigning king right now. And as the king, he has chosen to be with us by his spirit, and he has empowered us so that we can accomplish the mission he's given to us. Therefore, what's the worst thing that could happen to us? Worst thing is somebody could take our lives, and then guess what? We get to go be with Jesus. Right? In other words, we have everything we need. There's not one thing we are lacking to accomplish the mission that Jesus has given to us. We have everything we need because he is with us. Therefore, my question for you is this. What's the next step you need to take today to take a step toward faithfulness to being on mission to make Christ known as the king? Maybe for some, it's as simple as just pick up an OCC box on your way out and go fill it up, and it'll be sent somewhere around the world with a message of the gospel connected to it. Very gospel-centered ministry. Maybe it's getting involved in the, the, the rummage sale next weekend and being a part of a Mexico mission trip. Maybe for some of you, the next step is getting involved in a ministry that's, that's focused on impact. Through our church, through one of the parachurch ministries in town, maybe for some, it's like, I need to get involved in an impact outreach type of ministry. Maybe for some, the next step is you just need to start going to your agora and being more intentional and looking around at people and praying for people and developing a, a burden for lostness and just caring about people. And then, and then for some, I hope the next step is start looking for opportunities to open your mouth and have conversations and point people to Christ and talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Death, burial, resurrection. Reigning king, returning soon. You need to respond. You need to repent. Maybe for some in here, the next step is you need to go. And you can sense God is calling you to go. And the next step for you, you just need to, you want to pray. You want us to pray with you so you can discern where might God be calling you to make Jesus known as the resurrected king. Listen to this. He commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Let's pray. Father, we confess that Jesus is the resurrected king. We need him. We need his death for us, for our sins. We are grateful and humbled that you have brought this message to us through the apostles and through countless others who sacrificed so that we could hear and receive this message by faith. I pray every person in this room and every person watching online would hear this message today and respond to it faithfully with repentance and faith and believing in Christ. I pray that we would respond by being faithful witnesses, that this message of Jesus would be central in our lives and central on our lips, and that we would be faithful to be on mission that you've called us to, to go where you call us to go. I pray that we would be clear and bold and uncompromising and at the same time, kind and loving and humble as we are empowered by you and your spirit. Use us for your purposes of making Jesus Christ known as the resurrected king. We pray it in his name. Amen. At this time, we're going to respond by singing. If you would like to respond by talking to a minister, I'll be right back there at the back of the room. If you say, God's stirring my heart. I want to know more about how to be right with God through Christ. We want to talk to you about that. If you say, I want to be a part of this church and be on mission with this church, we'd love to talk to you about that. Or maybe you say, I do sense God calling me to go, and I'd like for the church to be praying for me. We'd love to pray with you. 
So let's stand as we invite you to respond. Thank you.